clock on the wall, it's about that time. So, and I'm not sure if that clock's a little bit fast, but it seems like the one outside's a minute or two slower, but by the time it, everybody settles in, it'll be about right. If you would, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> Appreciate the help, Bob. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 is where we'll pick up. But before we begin, just a few things. First and foremost, happy Mother's Day to our mothers. It's a beautiful day. And I was looking through the announcement list. Is there anybody that needs to be added to the list? Uh, anything that's happened since it's been printed? Now, Kathy had mentioned baby Lux is off the breathing machine and breathing on his own, so that's a blessing. It's good to have our visitors here today. We're very appreciative of your presence. Anything that needs to be added? Yeah, Beth. Very nice. Very nice. So thank you, Bev, uh, for all the mothers. There's carnations, and uh, they're out in the foyer, I assume. Yeah. And what? In the Tupperware, there's some carnations for the mothers. Please take advantage of the good hospitality. So, yep. Keep Deborah's sister and Deborah, cousin, sorry, cousin, uh, family, uh, keep them in your prayers. Just that's not a, when you said it wasn't a stroke, it's like, oh, good, but that's not good. So sorry to hear, sorry to hear the news. Anything else? Keep Judy in your prayers. She's taken another fall and broken a couple of the ribs at least, so keep her in your prayers and Roy as well. Okay, very good. Bob, do you mind to lead us in a prayer before we begin, please? Now, Father, we are indeed thankful again for the opportunity to be able to assemble and to study your word. Father, we're mindful of those that have been just mentioned and all of those that are on our prayer list that stand in need of your assistance. Father, especially Debbie's cousin, as we, we beseech you on her behalf, Father, that you would comfort her and help her in the way that you see that, that she needs. Help us to be mindful, Father, of those that do stand in need. We pray, Father, that we'll be made aware of those things that we can do and that we'll be motivated to help in whatever way that we can. Father, it, it ought to help us to appreciate the, the health that we ourselves enjoy. Father, we're grateful to you for your word and the fact that it's been preserved uh, even to this time in order that we might be able to adjust our lives in such a way that we can live pleasing to you here and expect, Father, to spend eternity with you. We're thankful for Dan and for his ability to teach. We would ask, Father, your blessing on him this morning as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. 
pray, Father, help us to learn those things that will benefit us and those that are around us. And help us to have the wisdom to be able to make application to our individual lives so we might be able to help others. We're thankful to you for Jesus, Father, and it's in his name we humbly ask this prayer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you would, uh, Galatians chapter 3, and we'd made it down to, I believe, um, verse 15. That's where we'll pick up. And I hope we can get through the remainder of the chapter today. I'm not sure that we will, but we'll give it our best chance, our guess, best shot. But Galatians chapter 3. Now, I always kind of go back and kind of rehash a little bit of where we've gone and, and been and always kind of helps us stay in the context of this, this book, this chapter especially. But remember that when Paul wrote to brethren, that he wrote that in verse 6, he marveled that they were so soon removed from the gospel, not that there's another, but he was just amazed that they had chosen to remove themselves from that standpoint. In, in verse 1 of chapter 3, he again calls them foolish Galatians, asking who had bewitched them to not obey the truth. So they had forfeited themselves from that standpoint of leaving what he had originally taught them. And from that standpoint, he lays out in chapter 3, as I'd mentioned very much, the evidence of a case that was really of what the truth is and what they had had and what they had forfeited. And really, we're going to get into this morning um, what they should have known, what they should have done, and what they should have been looking forward to, and in that accepted. But again, as we uh, get to this point, remembering that the Jews were wanting to hold on to some of the law. They were wanting to hold on to some of their traditions. They were wanting to hold on to especially circumcision, but probably other things too. And Romans chapter 14 and 15, um, where there's liberty, they bound, probably in terms of some of those dates and foods and things that identified them as Jewish. Um, but from the certainly, the, the key argument that we see in Scripture is that of circumcision. And so, from that standpoint, holding on to all that, we've gotten down to verse 15. But remember that up to this point in time that we've seen what the law is. And so he, he starts in chapter 3 laying out what the law is. And we went through that last week, a lot of the different terminology that we use. The Mosaic law, the law, the old law, um, the curse that it's written in, in verse 10. We talked about the mechanics of the law, that it can't be kept. The legally speaking law is rigid. It's got con it confines, as we're going to see some of the terms in the later part of this book here. It's binding. It's enslaving. It's got various characteristics to it that man could not keep. And so we're going to see also this week a little bit of the whys the law was necessary. And so... From that standpoint, we've gotten to, to verse 15. And remember also the reason that Paul is writing this book, actually, but especially this chapter, is to remind the Jewish brethren, but also all Christians, we're justified by faith. We are justified by faith. That's what the book of Romans is written about, too. Justification by faith. And so this book, too, very much, uh, this chapter is also that of justification by faith. Uh, verse 6 through 9, Abraham was justified by his faith. Their father, Abraham, as he would say, was justified by his faith. So it brings us down to verse 15. So in verse 15, brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, Yet if it be a confirmed, no man disannulleth, or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, 
which is Christ. And this I say, the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because the transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have come by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. We'll stop there and then pick back up. So in verse 15, let's notice that, now this comes on the heels of verse 14, which, you know, the blessings of Abraham might come onto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now we talked about that covenant, and the covenant being that all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And he talks about the seed here. But brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So God gave the covenant. We talked about that last week. We talked about that. That was God's promise to Abraham. Does, and, it, and it's really kind of a universal principle. Does man have any right to add anything to what God says? You know, it's in Deuteronomy it's spoken of, in the very last scripture of Revelation it's spoken of, but man has no right to add to what God has explicitly said. Um, we are so inferior, we have no right to do that. And similar, when he makes a covenant to Abraham, that's what he's saying here, no man can disannul. Nobody, no man can take that away. And he's building on this principle in terms of the next verse or two. You know, what man might he be talking about specifically? And he talks of a man who's a mediator later on. Well, I'll take that back to Moses, the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law did not disannul the covenant. And in fact, that's what he says in a verse or two, that 430 years later it comes in. And so the, the Jewish mindset was they were keeping the law. They were the works of the law. They kept the law. That's all they kept their mind on. That's, that's what they justified themselves in, even though they could not keep it but they still go back to the works of the law. But prior to the law is the covenant. And really the covenant was superior to that because of the promises that he's talking about would come on the heels of the covenant, the promises of Abraham. All seeds would be blessed. All nations would be blessed. Salvation would be available to all, not limited to the Jews. And so from that standpoint, no man can disannul or add to. Now, the Jews wanted to add to it, too, but don't get me wrong, they, they have no right to add to nor disannul the, the law. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to the seeds. Now, the Jews thought they, being the Jews, were the fulfillment of that covenant. But as Paul lays out the case here, if they were the fulfillment of the promises, then the promises were already there. They were already fulfilled. They were already completed uh, in verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise. If it's present, then there was no future fulfillment. 
And he also mentions in, in verse 17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul the covenant. Okay. So this is some of the mechanics of law that makes it a little bit confusing, but think of it this way. Um, think of city limits. You have a city limit. Does that city limit ever get expanded? Yes, they sure do. Now, when someone gets annexed into the city limit, does that annexation do away with all the ordinance of the city? No, does not at all. You know, now, being annexed in, those people that are annexed in to that then are simply given the benefits of utilities and infrastructure and the things that people in the city enjoy. And so from that standpoint, being annexed in doesn't change that original ordinance at all. And so the old law, Mosaic law, 430 years later did not disannul or do away with anything the covenant made to Abraham. They weren't the fulfillment. Uh, that wasn't the promise. That wasn't the promise that uh, God gave Abraham. And therefore, at the time of Christ, that being the case, the promises, if they'd been fulfilled under the old law, there'd be no need for Christ. And that's it's one of those things that's self-evidencing. They did know that Christ, as he came, brought to them freedom and liberty and faith. They had accepted that. But then they turned and they're going back to something that's inferior. And so Paul, again, lays that out from that standpoint. I think of it kind of like this. In our country, we have a constitution that we, you know, Put in the law 250, you know, almost years ago, and uh, you know, as of 50 years ago, they they said it was legal to kill babies, but that wasn't ever in there. But um, but they did it nonetheless. But um, you know, I kind of compare it to the the Constitution and how it doesn't change. You know, mm -hmm. but yep. very true. So we can a lot of people. A lot of people today in ignorance try to do things to change it from the standpoint, not legally, not amending it, not going through the process, but that doesn't change it. You're right. So, very good point. That's another way to look at it, too. So, in terms of that, um, that covenant was valid. That's the point that Paul's making here. The, the covenant to Abraham stood valid, and it stood valid up to Christ. And so then he talks in verse 19, Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Again, he says seed. The seed should come to the promise that was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So wherefore then serveth the law? You know, that's, that's kind of the first question in terms of that. So what was the purpose of the law? We kind of talked about it a little bit. Exactly, exactly. I don't know what's right. It's not in me, and it's not in you, truthfully. It's not in us. If it weren't written down, and that's the purpose of the law, that it did show confines of what is right and what is wrong. And it does that. Now, we can't keep it. We fail in it. But at least we know that's where our knowledge of righteousness comes from. And the second purpose, God made it to be good by symbol. Now he's going to take the symbol to take care of it. Yep, yep. And, and that being the case, you know, that brings in the error of grace because law does not have grace. And that's what he's, he's pointing to. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, when you're in the confines of law, if you violate one part of it, what have you done? You violate the whole thing. And that's the legal principle that we've talked about. That's the curse of the law. That nobody can keep it. 
Christ was the only one that was able to keep it, but that's what made him also the perfect lamb to go to the cross, his blood then, the redeeming value for us, for our sins, when we're obedient to him, and we're going to get into verse 27 here in a minute. But from that standpoint, that's, that's the promise made. The promise that the law, they should have known, they're not able to keep it. There was a promise made yet in the future of an inheritance, as he says in verse 18, but the law did teach them right and wrong in terms of that. Look at Romans chapter 320. I think we looked at it a week before or two. Romans 320. And kind of what we had mentioned, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. If he didn't give law, we wouldn't know when we've done something wrong. Wrong. Uh, it is through that law that we know both what is good, but also what is bad. And from that standpoint, that's what also should direct us to do what's right. When we've done something wrong, we recognize it, correct it. Uh, but from that standpoint, this part of the what Paul is writing, knowing that, that they couldn't keep the law, that they did know right and they did know wrong, should have been looking to, it should have driven them to recognize Christ when he came. But they didn't. I think they did, but they rejected it. They should have been welcoming it. They should have been looking forward to it. They should have known that they couldn't keep it. But anyway, so, so that was wherefore the, then serveth the law. It was added because of the transgression. Till Christ, the seed, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Who is the mediator? Uh, Moses, the mediator of the law. So he was the mediator of that law as it came because given to him by on Mount Sinai, he was the mediator. He was the one talking to God in terms of that. Now, several talked to him back and forth, and that's why it says, now a mediator is not a mediator one, but God is one. For the whole children of Israel, he was that mediator to them. And, and there's a very similar... Um, there's a type and an anti-type between Je Moses and Jesus. You know, if you look at the, the lifeline of Moses and Jesus, there's always this type and anti-type in comparison. Um, so he was, under that law, the mediator given to him in Exodus chapter 20. Um, and interestingly, look at, I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, I think. But I don't want to get wrapped up into the angels part of this. In Exodus chapter 20, God said, this is the law. God said. We don't really have any account of, because when you look at this verse, ordained by angels, I'm just going to briefly say it, ordained by angels, messengers. Um, Deuteronomy 33, is it 33-2? Is it? Has anybody looked at that? I, I just... It's either 33.2 or 33.6, I can't remember. But it describes a heavenly host that came with God at the time that he delivered the law. So their presence. Go ahead. Hang on just a second. Haley's got a job. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawn and, and dawned on them from Sire, Seir, and the, uh, he shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of his saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yeah. So the heavenly hosts were with him. Stephen references the same thing in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just saying, Paul's mentioning of it here, Stephen's mentioning of it. In the Exodus account, it seems like it's very much God the Father giving the law directly to Moses, but again, we have to be mindful that Moses could not see him face to face, so those, the holiness of the angels 
simply delivered then maybe, I don't know the mechanics of it, the law to Moses. It doesn't say in Exodus chapter 20 how that happened, but they were there in his presence with him as it's delivered. And so that's what Paul's referencing him being ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. It uses the word appointed in sure. your version, which is what? King James. King James, original King James version. That's what I did on my memory work. Uh-huh. So, and, and this one says appointed through angels. And the only thing I'll say, and it, you, like you say, you could go into a long oh, dissertation, yeah. but we won't. Yep. But what I would like to say is that this was such a powerful point in the life of God's people uh, that the book tells us that 10,000 mm-hmm. angels were present with God mm-hmm. when he came down and his spirit sat down on Mount Sinai mm-hmm. and the mountain shook, it quaked. No wonder those people were afraid. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. So from that standpoint, um, you know, that's why the purpose of the law was given till the seed would come that's who the promise was made mediated uh, here at this time uh, by the law and then he asks in verse 21 is the law against the promises of God God forbid for if there had been a law given which had given life now what oftentimes was the law referred to as being the law of what yeah sacrifice and death Again, another reason that they should have been looking forward to life. But if there had been a law given which had given life, verily, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded that all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now this is where they really should have started picking some of this stuff up, the Jews themselves. They should have been directed to look for faith. They knew the confinements of the law. They knew that the law was death. They knew the curse of the law. They knew that every year they pushed it forward. They were reminded every year of their sin. It was an inferior law from that standpoint to what was given through Christ, which was life. And the promise by faith of Jesus Christ. So they, they should have known. But they didn't. This promise is given by Moses, I mean, given by, to Abraham. It was said it was to the seed. Here comes Jesus into the scene. This One. new law had nothing to do with, with the promise it gave because that, that, that promise was not going to be fulfilled until Jesus died on the cross. Yep. And they should have been directed to know that, knowing uh, the, the inferior aspects of the law. They should have known. Go to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Hebrews chapter 8, and verse 7 and 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And he goes down, but verse 13, And in that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So they weren't under it. Shouldn't have been bringing it back. Shouldn't have been looking back to it. Shouldn't have been wanting to go back to it. They should have been looking forward to what they had currently in Christ. But that's why he calls them, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you. And he points up to verse 22. Is 
is that um, God wanted people to trust him. I mean, in the Old Testament, too. I mean, it was, that was the, the whole reason that he would be unhappy with them is because they would not trust him. They trusted in themselves their alliances with other people, with other countries, and they trusted in their ability to do the checklist, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. uh, I did this, I did this, I did this, but they were not putting their trust in God. And uh, a lot of times God would have countries come in and take them over mm -hmm. until the remnant that was left, you know, were the people that usually trusted in God. And then this new law, when it comes in, it's completely trust in God. Absolutely. And so, you know, That's a good point. <clears throat> you know, you look back, and the Old Testament is so rich. I, lo I love the Old Testament. I really, really do. But the Jewish people really, through the time of Abraham on, just messed it up. I mean, every time you turn around, they're messing it up. And it's just, I, I'm not saying that I messed it up any less, but at least I'm saying that, you know, they were in the, right there in the, God's leading them through the wilderness. He's feeding them manna. He's doing all, and they're murmuring. Just from then on, it was just always, you know, taking in idols from other countries, like you mentioned, and other influences, and just giving away everything they had. It, it just, it, it dumbfounds me sometimes, but it, the, the Old Testament's rich, and you're right, and it should have provoked trust. To be in the wilderness is desolation. You should have trusted something. You gotta trust something. Yeah, and so many times you'd think that they would, but they turn to something else, and there's not like two choices, God or mammon, who you're going to serve, and instead of being in the wilderness, knowing that God's feeding and guiding them, what do they choose a lot of times? Something else, <laughs> and it just dumbfounds me, but I say that to say this, it's so rich, the Old Testament, um, the accounts that bring them to this point, uh, and we too can learn that lesson that, that it, it should drive us to trust in terms of our faith and belief in Jesus and our Heavenly Father. So verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which would be afterwards be revealed. So it had not been revealed prior, it was shut up, it was kept, and they were bound, my version says kept under the law, bound under the law. So the law is binding, it's restrictive. Uh, they were shut up into uh, uh, awaiting the coming of faith to be revealed. In verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And that's the, the, the verse here, this justified by faith you know, is the point that he really nails down with the Jews that you should have known. Your old schoolmaster, the schoolmaster that should have been teaching you that that law was inferior, that it was binding, that it was restrictive, that there was something coming to fulfill the promises given to Abraham. And you should have known that and seen that. That schoolmaster should have brought you to that point. He can do the same thing for us. I mean, seeing the, the same thing for us, it should bring us the same, that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the faith that had come, Christ, who had came and, and given himself on the cross, dead, buried, resurrected, the New Testament enforced because of that testament was now enforced based on his death. Um, there was no need for then the schoolmaster. They were in a new, uh, they were in a new, um, not era, but what am I thinking in terms of, excuse me, age?
going to yep. give them a new covenant. Yep. So it shouldn't have been a surprise to them when uh, you get to Galatians. We mentioned Hebrews uh, 8. From Hebrews 8, you look all the way back, and I think that'll take us back to Jeremiah yep. 21. Yep, absolutely. When there was sins would be Certainly. forgotten. And they couldn't do that under the old law. And so uh, this age that they're now in, uh, which had been ushered in based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there was no need for that Old Testament. There was no need for that schoolmaster any longer to bring them to that which has been delivered. So it was delivered. I'm going to kind of go through this so we can kind of complete this chapter. For ye are all, all. Now, who's all include? Everyone. All. <laughs> Gentiles. Jews. Everyone could now enjoy these promises. Ye are all the children, were the Gentiles children of God under that old law? No, they weren't. They were not. So now, ye are all the children of God. So children are, what are the privileges of being a child in, you can say God, but just even in, and it's common to us as well. What's some of the privileges of being a child the under someone's... And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what are some of those privileges that he's talking about? Okay. Okay. Protection. Protection under that redemptive plan that God had sent for everyone. Yes, so all the nations shall be blessed. Blessed through the redemptive plan that was offered for all. Through the blood of Christ, we have forgiveness, we have salvation, reconciliation, atonement. You don't have to put it behind, I mean, you don't push this forward once a year or every year. If you repent and change your life and change every time you do something, John 1 verse 5 through 7, you're cleansed, cleansing, that cleansing blood of Jesus is a privilege that we have. Jesus died once and for all. He died once and for all. But then that hope of eternity, that hope of an eternal home, and that's the promises that, you know, we have. So protection, salvation, freedom, liberty under that, grace, because when we mess up, which we will, what? Do we have to go back to the old rudiments of the law and be confined to that? Or do we have, we have true forgiveness? Uh, we have some in here who have adopted children. My nephew recently adopted, recently adopted a, a child. And the one thing the judges will tell you is that that child now has all the rights and privileges mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. heirship of your natural born children. Very true. There is no difference from one to the yep. other. They are in, they are yours and they enjoy that privilege. Very good point. And, I, and he goes through that in Romans more than here. Uh, but verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female, ye are all one in Christ. Let's not overlook the verse that I wanted to get to too. Verse 27, for as many as, I'm sorry, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now let's remember, you're all the children of God by faith in Jesus. As you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now this, this verse, a lot of people don't recognize, frankly. For those that just want to say, all you got to do is believe the Calvinistic doctrine of just believing only, John chapter 3, 16, and just accepting that and saying there's nothing else that you do for salvation, do not want to look at this verse, and they don't want to look at Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. But there's a very key word here, for as many as you have put on, I'm sorry, has been baptized into Christ. What's that into? Yep. It's the same word that's in Acts chapter 2, 38. Ice, E-I-S, into. 
A lot of people will look at that and say, well, they were already saved, therefore they put on baptism just as a mark of an outward sign of an inward spirit. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Into, were they, had they put Christ on before that? No. It's very much a very key point to make. It's directional. And up until that point in time, they had not. Up until that point in time, they were outside of Christ because they had not been baptized into nor put on Christ. They, so it's directional. It's like going to the city limits. We'll use the city limit thing. Hey, when you get to Springfield, you call me, okay, Clayton? Are you there yet? No, you're right here. This is where we're at right now. But when he gets to the city limits, what are you going to do? You're into Springfield. You'll call me. You can't do that until you're there. Into. You're not into the city limits. You can't call me. You're not going to call me until then. And you're not in there until you are. Yeah, and you then you're in Springfield. Yeah. 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 They're, they're exactly. So it's very much directional. It's very much based on time. You're not there yet. But based on time, when you're there, you'll call me. It is a place. It's very much a place. But until you get there, you're not there. And so that little three-lettered word in the Greek, a lot of people really misunderstand. And, you know, and it also has a motion to it. Because you can be going that direction, and until you're there, you haven't crossed that line. And it's the same thing in um, Acts chapter 2, 38. That's why they had to be baptized for the remission of their sin. They hadn't yet. They weren't able to yet. That wasn't a privilege they had until they did what he said, which was be baptized. Well, we know that all spiritual blessings are in the church, according to the Apostle Paul in the Roman letter. So if you draw a circle and the church is in that circle, mm -hmm. anybody that doesn't have the spiritual blessings of Christ are outside the circle. It's true. And how do you get into it? This scripture here, Galatians 3.27 Romans 6 and 3, and mm -hmm. even in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, baptized into one body. So how do we get into it? We're baptized into it. And you can't understand verse 26 unless you couple 27 with it. True. Because we're all sons and daughters. And 29. And how? <coughs> we're, baptized, we're baptized into the body. Very true. And you know, so then you do get those promises you know that he's mentioning in verse 29 the fulfillment of the covenant is that baptism and it, was into christ but galatians 2 20 christ lives in us mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. if we're crucified with him romans 6 and that's uh, how we put him on he's, yes, yes it's like clothing you see it right very good point you know this the, and i kind of I wish I had more time to talk about it, but it's an important point to make in the church today because there's actually some who are neglecting and saying, well, the necessity of baptism, mm, and they're, they're sidestepping it in the Lord's church. We can't. You cannot. I mean, that's just as easy as it is to understand, and it's, I've said it. You really have to have help to misunderstand verse 27. You have to have help to misunderstand Mark 16, 16. You have to have help to misunderstand Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. It's very straightforward. I was just going to say we do have to be careful, though, because sometimes we talk about being members of the church, and if you're a member of an of a organization, you usually join it, and we don't join it, we're added. Well, Acts 2, 42. So it gets kind of, you yep. know. God's, it, it God be, puts, puts Sometimes the there. wording can make things a little confusing, like it's a club you could join, and no. it's not. It's not a club or anything. Acts 2, 42, you're right. The Lord adds such as would be saved. And that's a good point. Uh, the church is his. He owns it based on the propitiation of Christ's blood that purchased it. It's his. We can't add to it. I can't add to it. Clayton can't add to it. Uh, but what we can do is be obedient to what he's talking about here. And as we do that, then we do have that promise uh, which we talked about. So anyway, uh, 
chapter 4, I think we'll get to chapter 4. I won't be here next week, but I'll be here the week to follow. So, I uh, appreciate the good comments. Huh? You want to do it? I hadn't asked anybody yet, so. <laughs> so Clayton will do chapter 4 next week. <laughs>